Recently, I was uh, reading a very interesting section of Srimad Bhagavatam. So I thought tonight and tomorrow night, when I'll also be trying to talk, I wanted to present this uh, incident from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Chapter 5, which is entitled Daksha Cursing Narada Muni. Now, both of these people, of course, are known to all of you who read Prabhupada's books. Daksha is Prajapati. He is not an ordinary person, very powerful man, right? He is Daksha, expert, and he's given the duty to help Brahma to populate the the universe. And Narada Muni is also a very important person in the universe because he is directly one of the sons of Brahma and his job is to, prop, uh, to, prop, uh, to proselytize, right? What they would call it, pre preach the message of Bhakti Yoga and make devotees, right? Our business, make devotees. Wherever we go, we proselytize, right? In the communist countries. Coming to proselytize, convert, want to convert us to your faith. So many, so many, so many difficulties are there in the preaching mission. Narada Muni, however, is undaunted. He's not greatly worried by these things. So he has a very interesting encounter with Daksha. Because Daksha, true to his name, he was very expert and he conceived 10,000 sons in the womb of his wife. Not an ordinary thing. Right? No man today can ever hope to, you know, you get twins, wow, you're really, wow. <laughs> People think big, very, very powerful. <laughs> uh, one of our devotees Antaranga, Gopal, his wife delivered twins. So, huh? <laughs> yeah. So people were saying, wow, very powerful. So, Daksha, 10,000 sons. Antaranga, two daughters. Anyway, 10,000 sons very great. So the idea of the father is he wants the sons to help in his mission, populate the universe, produce progeny. So he grooms his sons and they're all of very good character. They're all of similar nature, similar character and 
they grow up very nice and when the time is ready, father thinks, good time, I have to get them ready for marriage. So traditionally, in the Vedic culture, we see again and again in Srimad Bhagavatam, before entering into family life, the man first of all goes to do some austerity. Even today, people do like this. Buddhist countries, in Thailand, one of the young men we knew, he was getting married, grandmother said, let him go to be the monk first. So he goes, becomes a monk for a few months, then comes back, and then the marriage. So similarly in the Vedic culture, Daksha sent his sons off to go to the holy place, very special holy place where many great sages and yogis were engaged in doing their meditation and austerities. At least 10,000 sons all went there and they began to do their great austerities, living on only water and air. We cannot imagine for months, not just a day, you know, if we do near Jao for one day, whoa, yeah. we're rattled after one day. So you could imagine the great austerities, these young men, 10,000 of them, they all went there and they lived on water and air for several months. So Narada Muni happened to come there and he saw their behavior and he thought, such nice young men. He thought, what is the need of them just simply fulfilling the desire of their father to enter into family life and produce progeny? Narada Muni considered, they're really good young men, it would be a great shame for them to give up, all, to stop all their austerities and go back and enter into the family life. So Narada Muni approached them and he began speaking to them, telling them in an allegorical way about things which only they could understand. He was telling them how there's a kingdom where there's only one person and there's a river which flows in two directions and there's an unchaste woman and she has a husband. Like he was telling about ten different things. Narada Muni was telling these things to these 10,000 young men and all of these 10,000 young men considered the significance of Narada Muni's words and they understood the significance of Narada's teaching very nicely. They understood that Narada Muni was explaining to them the futility of material life and the necessity to pursue the path of enlightenment and go on and perfect their spiritual realization. So the 10,000 sons, after associating with Narada Muni, they didn't go home. They went on and continued their self-realization. When the news came to Daksha, he lamented, my, my poor sons, they've gone off, they're not coming home, they don't care to help me 
in my mission to, pro to produce the progeny, to fill up the universe. In this way he lamented for his dear sons. But Lord Brahma came there and Lord Brahma consoled Daksha. But don't worry, it's all for the good. Lord Brahma had similar experience with his sons, right? Four Kumaras. They didn't also want to grow up. They didn't want to do what Lord Brahma wanted. They simply wanted enlightenment. So Lord Brahma consoled Daksha and encouraged him, try again. So Daksha continued and next time he had 1,000 sons. First time was 10,000, second time only 1,000. Anyway, they were all of noble character, good behavior, and he groomed them nicely. And as they grew up, then again it became time for him to send them to do their tapasya go and do the austerity because you want to produce progeny first of all you have to purify yourself you have to get control over the mind and senses we want to have good progeny so the boys were all sent off to do their austerity interesting to note Daksha sent them to the same place where the 10,000 boys had gone before. Now, we may question, why would he send them back to the same place? He knew that 10,000 of his sons had already met Narada Muni and gone off and not come home. But again, he sent 1,000 sons, he let them walk to the same place. So, Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport to that section that it's the duty of the father to educate the sons, both materially and spiritually. And then, it's the choice of the son. Father cannot force Father cannot say, you should do what I say. But they, they, they should be given the opportunity. The, the boys should be given the opportunity for themselves. They have to be taught spiritual knowledge. You cannot deny them the opportunity to be educated in spiritual knowledge. At the same time, they can also have material learning. They can be taught material things too. But then the choice is up to them. Actually, the scriptures tell us don't become a parent, a father or a mother, unless you can deliver your children from birth and death. Don't become a spiritual teacher unless you can, unless you can deliver the disciples from birth and death. So the responsibility is there in the parents as well as in the spiritual teachers. They, they both have this duty to deliver the disciple, to deliver the children. But the choice is with the children. Which way do they want to go? They have to be given that freedom. Right? We cannot force people. Prabhupada had the experience. There was one young man and he came to prom, he had joined the movement. But after some time he realized 
Krishna consciousness was not for him. And he came to Prabhupada and he was telling Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, my father was a boxer. I cannot just simply chant, sit and chant Hare Krishna all day. He said, my father was a fighter, a boxer. I cannot just simply be a devotee like this. And so Prabhupada said, okay, what can I do? You don't want to be a devotee? Then go. The freedom is there. We don't force people. We, but we do give people the, the knowledge when they're willing to hear, when they're interested and they want to learn, then it is our duty to give them that opportunity. So in this, uh, this way, the, the 1,000 sons of Daksha, they all had come there to do austerity in the same place. And they were doing the same austerity, living on just simply water and air. Prabhupada explains, we cannot do that kind of austerity. The austerity for us is following the four regulated principles. No meat, fish and eggs, no intoxication, no gambling and no illicit connection with the opposite sex. And chanting 16 rounds. This is our little austerity. This is what as much as we are expected to do in the Kali Yuga. We cannot do the, the great things they were performing in previous ages. But that little austerity is very powerful in the Kali Yuga. Prabhupada said, if we faithfully keep these four regulated principles and maintain the daily chanting of 16 rounds, he said, at the end of our life, Krishna will force himself into our mind and take us back to God. Guaranteed. Prabhupada had complete faith that if we strictly follow this process, then Krishna will deliver us from birth and death. Right? It's Krishna who delivers the devotee. It's not that we deliver by our efforts, but Krishna himself comes and delivers the devotee. So Narada Muni visited that holy place and he saw the 1,000 sons of Daksha all there doing their austerities. And Narada Muni again was thinking, nice young man, why simply produce progeny? Let them go back to Godhead. Why they have to stay in the material world? They're doing this nice austerities. Let them get the real benefit of this austerity. Kali Yuga, people are not taught the importance of austerity. We don't want to even hear about doing austerity. But it's important part of Krishna consciousness. One of the pillars of religion is austerity. Hmm? Satyam Sojam Daya Tapa. All right? The four legs of Dharma. Satyam Truthfulness. Sojam cleanliness, daya, mercy, and tapa, austerity. People don't like the austerity. They don't like the other things either. But the tapa, whoo, <laughs> the austerity. What, what austerities do people do? They think austerity is going to work every day. They don't know the austerity of waking up for Mangalarti in the morning. 
That's a good austerity. Every morning, wake up early in the morning, do Mongol Arti, or come to the temple and see the Mongol Arti. Very nice austerity. Taking part in Krishna conscious program. So Narada Muni saw these young men. At this time, he appealed to them that, you know, your brothers, they went for enlightenment. They didn't go home to their father. Why would you want to go back to your father? Better you follow your brothers. Family attachment, right? You have a big brother, <laughs> have an older brother, you want to follow the brother. Even Lord Chaitanya, it is said, it is said that Lord Chaitanya went to look for his brother, Vishwarup, because Vishwarup had gone away from home when Lord Chaitanya was still a young child. So when Lord Chaitanya grew up and had renounced and taken sannyas, then at one point he said, I'm going to look for my brother. And he found out how Vishwarup had left the world in Pandalpur. In Pandalpur, right? Somewhere, some holy place in Maharashtra, he left the world there. And so anyway, the older brother, Narada Muni appeals to the 1,000 younger brothers. You should follow your older brothers, you know. Don't, don't worry about your father. He'll be okay. You don't have to worry about him. He can take care of himself. He's Daksha. He's expert. No problem. Just go for the enlightenment. Get the real goal. So in this way, the 1,000 sons of Daksha, they also renounced the world. They didn't go home. Very nice. Narada Muni was very happy and he took it upon himself to go and inform Daksha what had happened to his sons. So when Daksha heard that his sons, the 1,000 sons are not coming home, then Daksha lamented greatly. Young boys, they've renounced the world. They won't come home. One time in Mayapur, Prabhupada awarded sannyas to a number of young men. If you ever look at Yadubara's uh, videos, he's got these videos following Srila Prabhupada, you know. So there's one you can see the cut there. It's, uh, I think it's 1976, and there was several, about eight young sannyasis. And, you know, you see them getting their dandas. It was a big initiation. So one of Prabhupada's friends was there, maybe a god brother, and he said to Prabhupada, say, Prabhupada, they're all very young, aren't they? You know, in those days, you know, young, people took sannyas, you know, in their twenties, young men. And the man said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, they're very young to take sannyas. But Prabhupada said to him, he said, if they wait till they're old, what can they do? <laughs> so the man kept quiet. <laughs> what can you say? Prabhupada's arguments are so powerful, you know, just defeats everything, whatever somebody says. Yeah, what can you do in your old age, you know, when you're old, taking care of the body all the time? And so, don't wait till you're too old. You know? Take sannyas while you're still young, while you're still, while you still have some health and some energy in the body. So Daksha was lamenting, my sons, 
and he blamed Narada Muni. You are cruel. You claim to be an associate of Lord Vishnu. How can you do like this? How could you encourage my sons to renounce the world? They have a duty. They've not fulfilled their obligations. They're in debt. They're debtors. They're in debt to me, their father. They're in debt to the devas. They're in debt to the great sages. They should fulfill their obligations, pay their debts. They should have come home, got married, had children, had families. Then they can repay the debt to all of these great sages and personalities. Daksha is not familiar with the statement in the scriptures that for one who has surrendered to Lord Makunda, he is free from all debts and obligations. He is no longer considered a debtor because he has taken shelter of Makunda. So he is no longer obliged to anyone in the material world. Daksha didn't know this principle. So he accuses Narada Muni. It's all your fault. You misled them. You're supposed to be an associate of Lord Vishnu. You simply dress like a holy man. You're not really holy. You're cruel. Sending my sons away how you could do like this to me. Dakshal went on to say to Narada Muni, it would have been better to let them come home and experience the suffering in material life. Everyone agree? <laughs> People are all thoughtful. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of suffering is always there in the material life. Let my, you should have let my sons come home and experience the suffering of this material world. Then, after they have suffered, then they can renounce. People used to argue like that to Prabhupada. You know, when when Prabhupada would preach, especially to some Indian people, you know, telling them, you know, you should join the Krishna consciousness movement, they would often say, oh Prabhupada, let us enjoy the material life first, and then after we're suffered, then we'll come and become your devotees. Prabhupada would say, then the pigs should become the best devotees. <laughs> Because the pigs, they enjoy the most. They have unlimited food and they have unlimited sex. They're never satisfied and they never become devotees. So it's not a fact that you suffer and you'll learn to give up the material life. And in the purport, Prabhupada talks about how a woman suffers at the time of pregnancy, she carries the child in her womb. And she, at the time of the birth, she suffers so much. And she thinks, I will never have another child. So much pain, so much difficulty. But then, after some time, Prabhu, I want another child. Right? This is what happens material life. People are not satisfied with one child. They want more, more. Suffering does not always lead people out of the material world. We think, well, I have to suffer a little bit to enjoy. So Daksha was telling Narada Muni, you should have Encourage my sons to come home. Let them come home and suffer. 
get the, enter into family life and suffer all the miseries of material life, then after they're mature and suffering in the material world, then they can renounce. They'll be good renunciants. You force them to renounce with your preaching. You misled them. Daksha is really off, right? He's not a very devotional. So he was encouraged, he was really chastising Narada Muni. And eventually, he, Daksha then decided, I'm going to curse you. And Narada Muni's curse was, you will never have a home. So Daksha thought that was a curse. But for Narada Muni, not a problem. Narada Muni is the eternal spaceman. He's always traveling. Prabhupada's rolling stone gathers no moss. Right? So the curse of Daksha was very appropriate for Narada Muni. He does not have to have a home. That's very good, right? He doesn't have to worry. All the people who have the homes, they have the worry to maintain the home, to keep the home happy, to keep the home stable, to maintain everything. But Daksha Krishnarada, you will not have a home. For Narada Muni, thank you. Very nice. It's a blessing not to have a home. Prabhupada said, in the same way, he said, I have also been cursed. He said, because I have stolen so many young boys away from the homes of the materialistic mothers and fathers. The materialistic mothers and fathers have cursed me that I cannot stay in any home. He said, Prabhupada said, although I have centers all over the world and every center is inviting me to come and stay there, I cannot stay because I have been cursed by the mothers and fathers of all these young men who have come and joined my movement. But Prabhupada then requests, he said, therefore I am requesting all the sannyasis and the leaders of the Krishna Consciousness Movement to take that curse on my behalf and to travel and preach on my behalf and let me stay in one place and I will continue and translate the books. So, the question is sometimes raised that why would Narada Muni come back to see Daksha after this because he knows Daksha is going to be you know really unhappy and lamenting the loss of his sons so why did Narada Muni bother but Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur explains that Narada came back because he wants Daksha to also become a devotee He's thinking, you know, Daksha is really a great soul. He's really a great man. He got the position of a Prajapati. He must have had a lot of pious activities to get that position, to become so empowered, to become such a great soul, to do this work of populating the universe. It's not an ordinary person. So Narada Muni thought, we should also try and deliver him. So let me come back. And if, when he sees me, he will get angry at me. And he will get angry and he can curse me. That's okay. But he will get it out of his chest. He won't have that bitterness on his chest anymore at me. And, I, and he may even regret all his anger and all, all his cursing of me. And then we can make him also a devotee. So this is the glory of Narada Muni. That he's thinking to make even Daksha a devotee. To bring him also into Krishna consciousness. And even at 
the taking the curse upon himself, he doesn't worry about himself. He's thinking about how to give mercy to Daksha, to bring Daksha up into Krishna consciousness, and to relieve him from all his material attachments. So this is the greatness of Narada Muni, that he is willing to do all of this to bring people to Krishna consciousness. Such an expert preacher. And we see throughout Srimad Bhagavatam some of the different strategies used by Narada Muni in preaching to deliver the people. So wonderful, such a great soul traveling everywhere and accepting Kursh. No home, very nice. Just like Lord Chaitanya was cursed on one occasion at the time when Lord Chaitanya was living in Mayapur, they were having the nocturnal kirtans in the home of Sri Thakur every night. Lord Chaitanya decided, let's not sleep anymore at night. Why waste our time sleeping? We'll have kirtan all night. So all the devotees would come there to Srivas and have kirtan in the home. So some brahmana wanted to also see the kirtan and he requested Lord Chaitanya. But Lord Chaitanya thought this brahmana, he's not a devotee. If we bring, if we bring him into the kirtan, it will not, it will not, it will not be good for the atmosphere. When everyone is a devotee, when everyone's into the kirtan, then the kirtan becomes very powerful, right? Sometimes we have the experience at Rati Atras and so on, when you get a good group of devotees together, and you have a big kirtan, it's very powerful. But if you get a bunch of people who are not really devotees, who are not really chanting, just start walking and looking, you know, the atmosphere is a bit different, it's a bit restrained. So Lord Chaitanya told this Brahmana, no, 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 you can't come to the kirtan. At this point, Lord Chaitanya had not given, he had not delivered the holy name to everyone. It was only for the devotees. They locked the doors, closed the windows, keep all the non-believers out. So Lord Chaitanya told this Brahmana, sorry, you can't come. So Brahmana got angry, took his Brahmin thread, broke his Brahmin thread and cursed, I curse you, you will never enjoy material life. So Lord Chaitanya said, Haribo. <laughs> And shortly after this, Lord Chaitanya also went home and took sannyas. So that he was, the curse was kept. He didn't enjoy material life. He enjoyed spiritual life. Right? So we all have that choice. Material or spiritual. What do we want? I hope you all want the spiritual part. Right? That is the real place of eternal bliss and knowledge in Krishna consciousness. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any question? Yes, Prabhu. There's special benefit in the Dham, the holy Dham, right? There's, there are Tirthas and there's the Dham. Like people go to visit these uh, 
the Tirthas and Ramanujas, the Sri Vaishnavas, they often go to the Tirthas. Yeah. So, uh, Tirtha means a place where you cross over. The Dham is a place where you dive in and submerge yourself in the ocean. A bit different. The Dham is where the Lord resides eternally. Tirthas are different. You're crossing over. That's the, the meaning of the word Tirtha. So, the Dham is certainly a much more powerful experience to be in the Dham. Because the Lord is personally present there, even today. And we can, we can, ex we can experience, we can see the places of the Lord's pastimes and everything there. So very special in the Dham. Mayapur Dham, Vrindavan Dham, Dwarka Dham, these places, these are very special places. The Lord is residing there. So, but going to visit holy places depends also on association. You want to be in the association of pure-hearted devotees and you want to hear from them the glories of the Lord in these particular places. Prabhupada says in Nectar of Instruction, everything depends on the attitude of the, the devotee. So it's not just going to the holy place, but it's how we go to the holy place and what we do when we're in the holy place. If we simply just go and eat and sleep, the prophet was concerned in the beginning when we had the first Gaur Purnima festival, the devotees were coming and they were just laying and sleeping, and prophet was very concerned. So later on when he saw the devotees organize seminars and have classes and everything, then he thought, this is good, yes, this is, we have to properly engage the devotees. So coming to, going to the holy place is, you don't enter the holy place just by buying a ticket. We have to change the consciousness. So that's why association is very important. We want to hear from the saintly people who live there in the holy places. We want to get their association. We want to be fully engaged, absorbed in service when we're in the holy place. We go there to increase our service. We don't go there for a vacation. We go to increase, do more chanting, more hearing, more seva. Of course, we take also new people to the holy places. It's a great responsibility to bring people to the Dham and to the holy places, to introduce them to the holy places. It's a lot of effort. You have to constantly be with them, guiding them, watching them, talking and encouraging them, inspiring them in the devotional process. Very important. You bring people to the holy place, you want to make sure they get proper guidance, proper instruction, how to act, and what to do, what not to do. Just like Govardhan Hill, People, when they go there, they start walking on Govardhan Hill. They don't know. They don't know. Nobody's supposed to walk on Govardhan Hill. Lord Chaitanya didn't 
encouraged, didn't allow devotees to walk on the Govardhan. But if you go alone there, oh, the Govardhan Hill, let me climb the Govardhan Hill. I will take some pictures from the top of Govardhan Hill. People don't know. It's so very important. We take people there to the Holy Dawn. We have to be with them. You have to guide them. And you have to arrange for them to get a lot of hearing, chanting. Opportunities to do seva. It's very important. Okay. Hare Krishna. Distribute prasada.